Then how many of you have ever heard the phrase, life isn't always greener on the other side? You heard that? Okay. Well, the story is told of a young man who decided to try something new. Uh, he'd been going to the same old boring barber shop for years and years. The same barber had been cutting his hair the same old way, month after month, year after year, in the same old worn out looking building. But just across the street, a new barber came to town and he had a building about as fancy as you could get. It had a TV screen in it, fancy lights. I mean, it was as good as you could get for a barber shop. And he thought to himself, you know what? Something this good looking has got to be better. So he went the very next day and he was overwhelmed with how modern everything looked. The TV screen, the lights. He laid back in that sleek new chair, had that silver cape draped over him, warmly welcomed. The buzzers came to life. Everything was just going great. When all of a sudden he heard the barber say, oh no, oh man, no. And he looked into the mirror to see a section of his hair completely bald. It seems the barber forgot to put the guard on the clippers and shaved him completely bald. So the moral of the story is, life isn't always greener on the other side, and life isn't always better somewhere else. Amen? So today I'm going to be teaching out of the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth is really like reading a good novel. Um, it's filled with ruin, repentance, romance, and redemption. And if you haven't really read that in a while, just read it this afternoon because it's a book you just can't put down. It's like reading a novel. It takes place during the days of Judges, and the, that time period was known with, uh, to be a lot of backsliding. You know, God's chosen people, the Israelites, they, they turned away from God during the book of Judges. And um, Judges 17.6 actually tells us that all the people, they did what was right in their own eyes. Not God's eyes, but their own eyes. Does that sound like today? Sounds like today to me. God's chosen people, they would backslide, and he would, he would bring war. He would bring famine to try to draw them back. And they would come back to him. They would repent, but it would only last for a short time, and they'd fall off again and go their own way again, doing what's right in their own eyes. Well, this is the setting for the story of Ruth. This is what is happening in the story of Ruth. So they find themselves in the middle of a pretty severe famine, and it has struck in, in the town of Bethlehem. And we see a family living there. It's a father by the name of Elimelech, a mother, Naomi, and their two sons, Malon and Kilion. And this famine, the Bible tells us, was so severe that Elimelech decided to take his family and move to Moab. Now, I don't want you to raise your hands for this question, but how many of you have made a bad decision in your life? I mean, a really bad decision. A decision that you later came to regret. A decision that maybe you made it on your own and you didn't take time to pray and ask God about his directions. Well, this is the type of decision that this move was for Elimelech. The Bible does not say that he prayed or that he asked God what to do. And we know that he didn't, because if he did, that family would have never moved to Moab. Because Moab was Israel's enemy. It was a pagan nation. Moab was known for idol worship and even, at times, human sacrifice. And the Israelites were told to have nothing, nothing at all, to do with the Moabites. But Elimelech, he, dis he escaped the discipline that God was giving his people. And he took his family, they packed their bags, they made the seven to ten day journey into Moab. See, Elimelech, he abandoned God's people in God's land, and he went to live with the enemy. And that's a very bad decision. 
Sometimes we too can be tempted when trouble or discipline comes to want to run away. Makes me think of Jonah. You know, he wanted to run. And sometimes we find ourselves in these situations where we just want to run away and we think, you know what, the grass is probably greener on the other side. Or we think, you know, there's things that's gone on in the world that, ah, you know, it just entices me and it wants me to go to the world and it wants me to go to Moab and leave Bethlehem. You know, we have times in life that that happens. That's the devil tempting us. And we have to be careful that we don't make a mistake. We should talk to God first before we make decisions in our life and allow him to guide us and direct us. And sometimes, sometimes it's important to stay in the discipline of God. You know, people, they like, to walk, they like to be a child of God because they like the benefits of being a child of God. But the discipline can be a whole other issue. But it's in times of discipline that we grow and we mature. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 to 12, it says, My child, don't reject the discipline of the Lord. And don't be upset when he corrects you, for the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. And the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for a disaster. They're to give you a future and give you a hope. Now, we like that verse, don't we? But listen to the next part. It says, when you pray, when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you. But Elimelech, he didn't consult God. And the plan didn't go too well. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it, can le it leads to death. And it turns out that Elimelech passed away in Moab. And Naomi is left with her two sons. Now that means that she'll be okay because they'll care for her. The boys grew up. They married two Moabite girls, Ruth and Orpah. But these two Jewish boys were out of the will of God. Because many, many times the Israelites were warned not to intermarry with the Moabites. I mean, they were told to have no association with them. And they married them. See, everyone in this story so far has made bad decisions. But we're about to see that even in the midst of bad decisions... God can still work. How many of you know that? Even when we think we've messed up, he can still work. You know, sometimes I talk to people and, you know, they gave their life to Christ as a little child and they walk away. Or they accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord for, you know, 20 years ago and they walked with the Lord and then something in their life enticed them into Moab, into the world, and they walk away. And, you know, those people, when they mess up, when they do something wrong, I found that they have a really hard time receiving forgiveness again because they have this mentality. They think that they've messed up too much for God to possibly ever love them or to ever be able to use them or to have good for them again. And, you know, the story of Ruth is proof that that's not true. It's proof that God can still work in the midst of really bad decisions. You know, we don't know how long this family planned to live in Moab, but we know they stayed for quite a while because the Bible tells us that 10 years later, the boys died, and Naomi is left with that, without her sons. And this, this would put a, a woman back then in a very, very bad situation because what this did was make her unable to provide for herself. <clears throat> and the Bible tells us that Naomi was now very bitter, and she was broken, and she was grieving. And then in Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 6, Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughter-in-laws got ready to leave Moab and return to her homeland 
So the three of them set out for the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. Naomi is now taking steps back to where God wants her to be. So for all those years, she wasn't where God wanted her to be. You know, no matter what you've done in your life, you can always go home. And that is something that I've always wanted my, my own sons to understand. Like, no matter what, I want home to be a safe place that they can always come back to. But you know, that's true with God as well. The story of the prodigal son tells the tale of a son who took his inheritance and he squandered it on unrighteous living. He squandered it all. And you know, he reached a pit so low that he longed to eat the slop that the pigs were eating. And he thought to himself, my father's servants have it better than I do. And he went home. He went home to find a father who was longing for him. He was looking for him. His arms were outstretched for him. And he, he, he threw a celebration for him. He went home to a father who wanted him. You know, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable of one lost sheep, and that sheep goes missing. And the shepherd leaves the other 99 in search for that one little missing lost sheep. And the Bible says that when he finds him, he rejoices more over that one than the 99 that never strayed. This is how God rejoices when a, returner, when a sinner returns home to him. He rejoices in that sinner coming home. Listen, you can always return home. You may have made bad decisions. You may have made mistakes that you think God will never be able to use you, but you can always return home because he's longing for you. He's looking for you. His arms are outstretched for you, and he's saying, son, daughter, come home. Come home to me. Come back to your Bethlehem. You know, on the road home, Naomi stops the girls and she tells them that she wants them to stay in Moab. She knows that it's going to be really hard for them in Israel because they're foreigners. And Orpha, she decides to stay behind after some persuading. But Ruth, she doesn't. Ruth wants to stay with Naomi. And then we hear the most beautiful words spoken by Ruth. She says, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I'll die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord punish me ever so severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. It's beautiful. Ruth wanted to stay with Naomi. Naomi was turning back to God. And Ruth was watching. How many of you know people are always watching you? They're always watching you. And when you turn to God, you can bring somebody with you. I shared before how I was 12 years old, and I was in the middle on this left-hand side in this church, and we'd had revival services all week. And the Lord was really drawing me to him that week, really severely. And I was scared. I was 12 but I watched my sister, who was three years older than me, come forward first and kneel down. And it gave me the courage to step out and accept Jesus as my Savior. You know, because people are watching you. You can bring someone with you to Jesus. They're watching how you live. They're watching how you face the challenges in life. They're watching who you turn to when the struggles get really hard. And when you turn to Jesus, you can bring him with you. Because how you live, how you live really, really does matter. Ruth was willing to leave her entire old life behind, live in a foreign land that she'd never been to before. She was going to live as an outsider. She was probably going to be the object of prejudice and possibly even violence. And yet she was willing to say, I will forsake my gods, and I will worship yours. You know, when we come to Christ, it is a lifelong commitment. It's a forever thing. 
It's leaving our old life behind. And we become new. We become new. By the way, the songs this morning were absolutely perfect for this sermon. We, we just we become new in Christ. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. You know, Ruth, she couldn't live in Moab and Bethlehem at the very same time. And we can't live in the world and live for Jesus at the same time either. You know, that's having one foot in the world and one foot in, in you know, living for Jesus, and that's a fence sitter. That won't work. We can't live for Jesus in front of certain people and then for the world in front of others. We can't do that. We're either all in or we're not in at all. Living for Christ Jesus is living a life that says, you know what, I'm not going to quit when things get difficult. I'm not going back. I'm not going into Moab. I'm going to walk with God, and I'm going to do it through the good and the bad. I'm going to do it through the thick and the thin. I'm going to do it through the plenty and the not enough because I'm not going back to Moab. And that's what Ruth was saying. She was saying, I'm going to worship your God, and I'm going to do it for good. Naomi, she left Judah during a famine, but she and Ruth returned during the barley harvest. Now, they needed food. They needed food, and yes, they were women, but they were going to starve without food. And so Ruth asked for permission to glean in the fields. And the biblical concept of gleaning is found in Leviticus chapter 19, beginning at verse 9. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. That was the Lord God's words. And, he, and it's the purpose of this Israelite law was to feed the poor and feed the foreigner and feed the widow and take care of the orphans. Next in the story, we see a new man enter the story. And probably if there was ever a perfect man, this just might be the one. You know, his name's Boaz, and he happens to be the relative of Naomi's late husband, Elimelech. And it just so happens that the field Ruth goes to glean in belongs to Boaz. Now, Boaz, he took notice of Ruth. He asked his workers, who's this young woman over here? And his foreman replied, she, they said, she's the foreigner from Moab, the one that came with Naomi. You know what? That wasn't a compliment. He wasn't just answering his boss's question. He's saying, she's the foreigner. She's the Moabite. She's the one we're not to have anything to do with. How many of you know that sometimes people say things about you and it's really not a compliment? We have to remember who we are to Jesus, not who we are to everyone else. That's for somebody out here today that wasn't part of this. And yet did Boaz say, hey, get that woman out of my field. Get her out of my field. She is a foreigner. She does not belong here. She is not an Israelite. She's taking work from the Israelites. She's taking food from the Israelites. Kick her out. Is that what he said? No. No. Instead, he went to her and he said, Ruth, don't glean in any other field. Stay here because I've told my men not to touch you, not to harm you. You know, we are commanded in Scripture to take care of the needs of other people. It is a command. We're to be kind to strangers. We're to love the outcast. We're to reach out to the foreigner. We're to love those that people reject. That's what Christians are called to do. And Jesus says, when you do it for the least of these, you are doing it unto me. That's what he said. Proverbs 21, 13 says, whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. And 1 John 3, 17 and 18 says, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? 
It says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And Boaz, he made some extra special accommodations to help Ruth. You can read about that today. And then we see a beautiful conversation between the two. This is where just a little bit of romance starts to come in. In Ruth chapter 2, verse 10, Ruth falls at his feet, and she thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I'm only a foreigner. She's saying, I don't deserve it. Why'd you do this? And he says, yes, I know. But I also know about everything you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. And I've heard how you left your father and your mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. And then Boaz spoke a beautiful blessing to her. He said, may the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. Let me ask you a question. Are you taking refuge under the wings of God? Is he your safe place? Is he your comfort? You know, we live in a world that is full of so much pain and so much anxiety, so much trouble. And we can take refuge in all kinds of things. But God should be our first place that we turn Psalm 46 says that God is our refuge and our strength, and he's always ready to help in times of trouble. It says the Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. Amen? The God of Israel, he is our fortress. He's here. Do we have any matchmakers? Anybody here love to matchmake couples? My mom does. I know my mom does. She said she could match anybody but her own kids with their mates. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, there's people that are matchmakers. And Naomi, she decided to play matchmaker in this story. But see, she knew the law. And she knew that Boaz had the ability to redeem Ruth. You see, in the law of Moses, God made these provisions for widows whose husbands had passed away and they had no children. And a relative could actually step into this situation and redeem this widow from slavery and even from, you know, losing all of her property. And the relative was to marry the deceased relative's wife. He was to have a son with her. He was to raise the son. This son would carry on the family name. And when the boy would be an adult, all of the property and all of the money would go to the boy. And the man who married the wife, raised the boy, did all this, would get nothing. See, it was actually expensive, and it was time-consuming. It was probably a pain to do it. And uh, the man that was willing to do this, he was actually known as the kinsman redeemer because he restored what was lost. So turn to Ruth chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. One day Naomi said to Ruth, my daughter... It's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain. Tonight he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now do as I tell you. Take a bath, put on perfume, and dress in your nicest clothes. And then go to the threshing floor, but don't let Boaz see you until he has finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. And Ruth's reply, I love it. She says, I'll do everything you ask. And this is the Hebrew law of redemption. This custom is not familiar to us, and it would have not been familiar to Ruth either. This was a culturally accepted way for Ruth to let Boaz know that she wants him to marry her, that she wants him to redeem her. In other words, she's asking Boaz to marry her. Boaz wakes up to find a woman at his feet on the threshing floor. Women didn't go on the threshing floor. Imagine how he was surprised. And Ruth says, spread your covering over me because you are my kinsman redeemer. You are the one who can redeem me. 
And Boaz says, the Lord bless you. You know, he knew that Ruth was a virtuous woman. He'd watched her. He'd watched her working and providing for Naomi. You know, she would gather the stuff. She would thresh it out herself. She was, she was working. And he, he watched her, and he knew she was virtuous. So it's all going really, really well at this point, right? I mean, they're going to be married. Everything's going to be perfect. Not exactly, because this is where the drama enters the story. Because Boaz has the knowledge to know that, oh, there is another relative, and he's closer than I am to Elimelech. So he has the first right to the redemption. So Boaz tells Ruth to stay there for the night, and in the morning he would go and talk to the closest relative. And Boaz says, if he's willing to marry you, very well, let him marry you. And if he's not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. Boaz was a really good man. The next morning, Boaz went to the gate where business was done. Their business was done in the town uh, square at the gates. And he went there, and the, the close relative was there. And the man, he wanted to redeem. The, he wanted the land. He said he would do it. But Boaz was really smart, and he said, wait, wait, wait. He said, remember the law. The law says you don't just get the land, but you get the wife. Oh, and in this situation... You don't just get the wife, you get the mother-in-law. How many of you would like to live with your mother-in-law? Tom, don't answer that. Um, <laughs> she's sitting here. Um, but anyway, that's what he said. He said, oh, by the way, you get Ruth and you get the mother-in-law. And the man said, ah, you know, I'm, I'm in a pass. I'm, I'm in a pass on that. You can redeem her. And Boaz's competition was eliminated, and Ruth could become his wife. And in Ruth chapter 4, verse 13, Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. And when he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant. She gave birth to a son. And then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord, who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. They named the baby Obed. Obed became the father of Jesse. Jesse became the father of King David. King David, we know, is in the promised line. 27 generations later, in this same family line, in the same little town of Bethlehem, came the Jesus Christ, and he is our kinsman redeemer of the entire world world. And Luke 168 says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. You know, this whole story, it points to Jesus. Just as Boaz was Ruth's kinsman redeemer, Jesus is ours. Each of us, Every single one of us has fallen short of the standard that God calls us to live. We've all sinned. We've all failed. We've all messed up. And the Bible tells us the price for messing up like that, for sinning like that, is death. That's the price that every single one of us should have paid, is death. But since we couldn't pay it, God sent his son Jesus to do that for us. And God placed the sin of the entire world on the shoulders of Jesus. And he paid for our sin by his precious blood. That's what paid our ransom. You know, just as Boaz was willing to redeem Ruth, Jesus was willing to redeem us. And that always gets me when I think about it. Do you remember in the garden, it's Matthew 26, in the garden they came for Jesus and he'd just been betrayed. Judas had just kissed him into betrayal. You know, they were going to take him away, beat him, crucify him. But Peter's in the garden with him and Peter draws his sword and he says, you know, I'll fight. That was Peter. I love Peter. Don't you love Peter? He's like, I'll take care of it. You know, I'll fight. And Jesus says, put it away. Put it away. He says, Peter, don't you realize 
that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly. But if I did this, how would the scriptures ever be fulfilled? You know, Jesus knew what he was called to do, and he willingly laid down his life, and he did it for you, and he did it for me. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. You know, when we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins and come into our heart, we go from being outsiders, outsiders in Moab, to being brought right into the family of God. And it doesn't matter what mistakes we've made. It doesn't matter where we came from. It doesn't matter what was in our past. It doesn't matter what we did in Moab. That is insignificant at that point. Isaiah 44, 22, it's God himself. Listen to what he says. He says, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me because I have redeemed you. You know what? God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us. I don't care what we've done. I don't care where we've been. I don't care what our life looks like even right now. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan. He's orchestrating. He's arranging circumstances around in order to bless you because that's what he wants to do. You know what? You can trust your kinsman redeemer. You can trust him with your entire life because he is faithful. He is faithful. Amen. You know, there are many, many lessons that can come from the story of Ruth. I just pulled a few things from it. But today, I really want you to focus on four of the main characters, because I believe that in each of these characters, we can see ourselves at some point in our life. You know, maybe, maybe you can relate to Elimelech. Elimelech, you know, he he was facing the famine. Maybe you're facing the famine right now or you're experiencing what you think is maybe the discipline of the Lord. You know, I want to encourage you today to allow what you are going through to draw you closer to Jesus and not closer to Moab. Allow it to draw you to Jesus. You know, or maybe like Elimelech, you're facing problems and you're not sure where to turn. You know, you don't know where in the world to turn. Maybe you're at a point in your life where you're saying, I just need to hear from God. Have any of you ever been in that situation? I just need a word, Lord, like a word. You know, you need his comfort. You need his support. You know, Elimelech, I believe he was a good man. I believe he was a good man because he was trying to care for his family. He thought his family was going to starve. So he took him to Moab where there was food. But what he didn't do was he didn't trust God when times were hard. He didn't trust God when life was getting difficult. He decided to run. You know, if you're sitting here today and you're saying, you know what, I need some help to trust God because right now my life is a little bit hard. There's some things going on that I can't really see the other side. And I just need some help to trust God and know that he hasn't deserted me. Know that he's still here for me. You know, if that's you, just slip your hand up real quick and back down. You know, just, just saying, I'm acknowledging God that I need you. I need you. One of my favorite verses is Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 3. I love this verse. It's God talking. And here's what he said. Listen. He says, do not be afraid because I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. He said, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. He said, when you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. And when you face the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up, because the flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Maybe some of you can relate to Naomi. You're finding yourself in Moab. Maybe you're not even sure how in the world you got there. Maybe you're struggling with one foot in Bethlehem and one foot in Moab. 
you're sitting in church, but you're dabbling in the things of the world and you know in your heart that it's not right and that it's not good. You know, this is called being lukewarm. In Revelation, Jesus gave John a message for the church. Listen, this message was for the church. It wasn't for the world. It was for the people in the church. And what he said was, those that are lukewarm, I'm going to spoo them out of my mouth. You can't have it both ways. The Bible says, choose today who you will serve. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you left your Bethlehem. You made some really bad decisions in your life, and you feel like you messed up too badly for God to ever possibly use you. You know, Jesus is saying, come back home, son. Come back home, daughter. I've redeemed you from the mistakes that you have made. He's saying, I've called you out of darkness. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood and my very own possession. And God is saying today, come home. Come home, come back to Bethlehem. If you're sitting here today and you're feeling like God's pressing on your, part, your, your heart right now, that it's time to come home. It's time to stop living two lives. It's time to stop living in the world and then in church at the same time. And it's time to come fully back to Bethlehem. If that's how you feel today, I just want you to very quickly slip your hand up and right back down. You don't have to leave it up. God's calling you back like the prodigal son. Your father, he's waiting. He's got these arms that are open wide. He's looking, he's longing, and he will celebrate your return. Maybe some of you can relate to Ruth. You say, I want this God that you talk about to be my God. I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't pay the price for my sins, and I'm in need of a redeemer. I need a kinsman redeemer. I need a Boaz to pay the price. I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to have hope that this life is not all there is. You know, for the believer in Christ, this life is not all there is. Life begins when we die. Wanda, that passed away, her life just started. And it's forever and ever and ever. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation, that today is the day to get right with Jesus Christ. You know, Ruth was the bride of Boaz, and when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you become the bride of Christ. And I know that's hard for men sometimes to comprehend. They're going to be the bride of Christ, but you will be. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is one day coming back to this earth for his bride. You know, the trumpet is going to sound... The dead in Christ are going to rise first. We who are alive and well, that's you and me. We're still living and breathing. We're going to rise into the air and meet them. And the Bible says forever, forever we will be with Jesus Christ. Are you ready? If that trump sounds, are you ready? Are you saved? Are you going to go? If you want to make sure that Jesus is your Savior and your future home is really in heaven, just slip up your hand saying yes to Jesus. As Nikki comes forward, we're going to close in a minute. But church, listen to me. We need to love people. And I mean, we really need to love people. Boaz, he was somebody who went out of his way to make Ruth feel safe and to provide for her needs. He showed love and compassion to a foreigner. He willingly paid the price to redeem her. He was willing. Remember, he didn't get anything out of it. He had to raise a son, pay for a, a wife, pay for a mother-in-law. But he didn't get anything out of it. God is calling the church today to love people. People are hurting. This world is full of so many troubles. Spiritual decay, political unrest, family problems, physical problems, struggles, hardships. People in this world, they're hurting, and they're really, really afraid. Last week, I received a text from my son, Austin. 
He said, Mom, a student in my college nursing program died by suicide today. And he said, and I quote, it's so important to be kind and caring to those around us showing them the love of Christ and being witnesses. We never know the deep struggles those around us face or when it will be their very last day. That's why every time I preach, I do an older call because we don't know when it'll be the last day for each and every one of us. Church, now is the time to shine the light of Jesus. You know, the darker this world gets, the more the light that is inside of God's people will shine brighter and brighter and brighter. That's why when we have all this political unrest and all these problems, I don't get worked up because it's time the church shines. It's time that we stop just being satisfied to warm pews and it's time that we go out into this world and we shine for Jesus. And one of the ways that we shine for Jesus is love other people really love them. Can you say today, I'm going to be willing? Willing. I'm going to be willing to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to keep the devil from getting my kids, to keep the devil from getting my family, to keep the devil from getting my, my friends and my neighbors and my community. I'm going to be willing. I'm going to love the unlovable. I'm going to love those who don't live the way I think they should be living. How can we bring them to church if we just don't love them? So they're not living the way you want them to live. Love them anyway. If they don't look the way you want them to look, love them anyway. Love them into the kingdom of God. Jesus says in John 15, 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So church, if that's you today, if you're willing to say, like Boaz, I'm going to love other people. And I mean, I'm really going to love them. I'm going to ask you to stand. But stand, stand right now to your feet if that's you. But stand saying, I'm going to love people like Jesus does. And I'm going to love them into the kingdom of God. If that's you today, stand. And here's what we're going to do. If any of you raised your hand or if any, of you want, if any of you want prayer, if you felt like you associated with, with Elimelech and you need to hear from God, if you feel like you associated with Naomi and, you know, you have one foot in the world and one foot in, in Bethlehem, you know what? I know it can be embarrassing to come up and ask for prayer, but there's strength in that. There's power in that. You know, Jesus says, don't be ashamed of me. If you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you someday. So if you need prayer, come forward, and I will gladly pray for you. If you associate with, with Ruth and you say, you know what, I just need, I need to know. I need to know if that trumpet sounds that I'm going home. I need to make sure. Don't walk out today and not be sure. Come forward. As Nikki sings the song, I'll be here to pray with anyone. So we're Pastor Phil, and, um, and then we'll close.